Hello everyone. Um, our today's lesson is about the adventures of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Um, so, um, as you see here, we have uh, three contents according to our syllabi, uh, as usual. The first one is the 19th century critical realism, general description of Victorian age. Charles Dickens uh, as the greatest novelist of 19th century and his literary activities. So it's the first content and we will talk about all of these things. And the second one, The Adventures of Oliver Twist as the first social novel by Charles Dickens. And the third one, Analysis of Characters, Themes and Motifs and also th Symbols in The Adventures of Oliver Twist. So. Uh, firstly, you should know about the social classes, about the general um, inf uh, general view of the Victorian era. So, um, the Victorian era in Britain was uh, dominated by the reign of Queen Victoria from 1837 um, to uh, 1901. And although it was a peaceful and prosperous time, uh, there were still issues within the social structure. The social classes of this era included the upper classes, as you see here. Oh, sorry. So, uh, upper classes, and uh, middle class, and also the lower class. And those who were fortunate enough to be in the upper class uh, did not usually perform manual labor. And instead, uh, they were landowners and hired lower class workers to work for them, or made investments to create a profit. This class was divided into three uh, subcategories, as you see. Royal, those who came from a royal family, and middle upper, important officers and lords, and lower upper, wealthy when, men and uh, business owners, so all these three subcategories, uh, they are including to upper class. And the expansion of the middle class um, during this time was due to the rapid growth of cities and the economy. It was also referred to as the bourgeois and consisted of those who had skilled jobs to support themselves and their families. Merchants and shopkeepers became popular occupations as trade, both domestic and overseas, flourished. The large scale of new industries such as railroads, banks and government meant that um, more labor was needed to make sure the cities were able to function. The white collar um, professions uh, had the ability to move up in the corporate rankings and earn a higher salary. It was helpful to have connections to those in powerful positions as they were able to get jobs more easily. And moreover, uh, the middle class uh, was also divided into two categories. Uh, higher level and uh, lower level, as you see. People from the lower middle class typically worked for those in the higher level. And it was the Victorian England social hierarchy. The working class consisted of uh, unskilled laborers who worked in brutal and uh, unsanitary conditions. Uh, they did not have access to clean water and food, education for their children or proper clothing. Often they lived on the streets and were far from the work they could get. So they would have to walk to where they needed to get to. Unfortunately, many workers resorted um, to the use of drugs like um, alcohol, opium, uh, to cope with their hardships. And the underclass, uh, so the lower class, uh, were those who were helpless and depended on the support of others. The poor and young orphans relied on donations to survive. Some women who were unskilled and could not get any jobs uh, became prostitutes in order to make a living. As they were extremely controversial, uh, Parliament voted to pass Contagious Diseases Act in 1864, which allowed uh, prostitution in military towns, but meant the women had to be forcibly checked for diseases. And uh, the 
act was meant to protect the man from uh, contracting diseases, of course, not the woman from being harmed. This mistreatment created a strong feminist movement among Victorian women who yearned for fair treatment. And finally, in um, 1885, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, Parliament passed the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which raised the age of consent and prohibited the use of brothels. And um, so, here we have uh, the general information about um, woman, gender issues, marriage, uh, roles of upper class women and roles of, of working uh, lower class women and also crime. Uh, so we should know about these things in Victorian era to be able to analyze uh, Charles Dickens uh, novels and also other Victorian uh, writers. So, uh, Queen Victoria reigned over the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland uh, from uh, 1819 until her death in 1901, and she came to represent a femininity that was revolved around the family, motherhood and respectability, the idea that the woman's responsibilities were to love and respect her husband before anything and perform all of the duties and course for the household. Herself, her husband Albert, and their many children became an icon of late 19th century middle class, femininity and um, domesticity. So, um, this is the general uh, review of Victorian woman, Victorian woman lifestyle. And also we all had uh, gender issues. During this period, the roles of men and women became more sharply defined than they had ever been in history. Rather than women working alongside the men in family businesses, the 19th century saw an increase in men commuting away to their places of work, leaving the women home all day to oversee the household. And this ideology of men and women occupying uh, separate spheres uh, was supported by the idea that uh, they were natural characteristics of men and women that suited each for different roles. Women considered physically weaker yet morally superior, best suiting them for the domestic sphere. And also marriage is the main uh, topic of Victorian age, the main factor. Women could not seem to focus on finding a husband, uh, lest it appeared they had a worrying amount of uh, some um, private desires. And women were meant to only desire marriage in that it allowed them to become mothers rather than for any uh, emotional satisfactions. And um, women had no choice but to stay poor until marriage, usually not even being allowed to speak to a man unless there was a married woman, uh, so a relationship. And uh, girls typically married in their early to mid-twenties to a groom around five years older than them in order to reinforce the natural hierarchy between the uh, genders. And after a woman married, uh, her rights and property ceased to remain her own. Everything that she owned now belonged to her husband, including her body, property and money. And uh, roles of upper class women, uh, the responsibilities of upper class and uh, aristocratic women were limited because of the common opinion that they were weak. And uh, these women uh, had a range of servants to perform the domestic chores for them, and so they usually just had to oversee them. An everyday task of upper class women was accepting and paying visits, as well as organizing dinner parties for their friends and families. And there were occasions where women could prove their uh, homemaking skills and good taste and to serve as symbols to others about their social status.
But the roles of working uh, lower class women is quite different. These women were distinguished from the upper class by having less education and fewer opportunities. Most women uh, worked in domestic service, either as a cook, maid or laundress uh, to a wealthier woman. Other women were employed as barmaids, waitresses, uh, chambermaids and washerwomen and so on. To be able to go uh, to work, mothers would often pay other women, usually very elderly or very young, to watch their children. And working women uh, could not afford to pay for servants, so besides their actual jobs, they had to do all of the household chores themselves. This was used as evidence to support that women should not be long in the workplace because their families were not being properly taken care of. And the other one, uh, crime, is also an interesting issue in Victorian age. By the start of the Victorian era, it had become clear that the prevalence of crime in England was an issue that needed to be addressed. The Industrial Revolution put new pressures on society, leading to violence. And collective living led to collective organization, which helped to create social disorder on a larger scale. And however, while the need for a police uh, was evident, it wasn't until um, 1829 when Robert Peel sponsored the Metropolitan Police Act and that the beginnings of a resolution were reached. And uh, as a result of this act was the Metropolitan Police headquartered at Scotland Yard. One of the earliest uniformed police forces, they replaced military troops and military as the uh, peacekeeping force in the London Metropolitan era. In early years, the police had minimal authority, but their uh, jurisdiction grew during the following 40 years and they were given the authority to arrest nuisance boys and street musicians, board vessels, enter gaming establishments, petrol fairs and perform search and scissors. And such authority was needed as crime rates were high. Evidence of the um, criminal activity is found in, uh, in um, the Night Side of London, uh, which written by Ewing Ritchie, and um, uh, so this distinction between the wealthy and the poor with uh, respect to law enforcement stemmed in part from the new concept of a criminal class, in the minds of the upper classes, the members of this underworld lived in the fifths of the East End and consisted of the poorest members of society. And um, after the formation and growth of the police force, crime began to decline. The penalties inflicted seemed to be a sufficient deterrent to criminal behavior. And punishments uh, ranged from imprisonment or flogging to capital punishment. And the introduction of um, side charity to the uh, judicial system led to experimental treatments such as a Bible study or forced silence and so on. So um, then let's talk about the children related issue that's more interesting and more painful part of Victorian era um, because um, this period um, they were involved to hard work and uh, they worked really in a bad condition uh, workplaces. So, um, the early baby boom and another one, child labor, um, bad condition of working places and coal mines, treatment of children, working conditions of adults and bust already, yeah. So, um, during the Victorian age, uh, there was an early baby boom, uh, which led to not only an increase in population, but also an advancement of industrialization. The progression of England as a society led to a greater demand for labor from both adults and children. And children took on hard-working jobs as coal miners, chimney sweepers, 
farm workers and domestic servants, railroad workers and so on. Um, some children were even forced to take on the role of a railroad worker due to the invention of t railway in 1825 by the Industrial Revolution. And child labor became an over, uh, overarching issue in uh, the early, um, early 20s. Um, and due to uh, lack of effort to improve working uh, conditions by the upper class, so early 20s I mean in 1820s, because the government was influenced by the wealthy to invest in luxury rather than promote protection for laborers, and many children suffered at work. The most uh, brutal uh, form of child labor took place in coal mines. Children were required to work uh, 12 to 18 hours a day in mines that were infested with rats and disease and had poor ventilation. Such harsh working conditions led to the development of respiratory problems and an increase in mine disasters. So it was not only at least 30 years later when uh, reformers began to take action against child labor. In 1875, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was founded as the first child protective agency in the world, so in, only in 1875. And uh, this organization set the tone for social reform and ultimately saved children from a life of cruelty and hardship. So, working conditions of children. To start off, uh, child labor was the most uh, critical issue prevalent at this time, as I said before, and uh, children as young as 11 years were made to work in dangerous mines and factories, and even children um, uh, who were three or four years old, they also involved to, um, to work. And it was really painful for that period because they were they had to be in the kindergartens and also uh, and primary school uh, because in a year of five, six, and seven years old children also involved to work in hard places, and they also worked as servants in other people's houses. They worked for long hours to support their families and were extremely poorly paid. As consequence of the growing number of factories and mines, which was a product of the Industrial Revolution, pollution increased. These factories, chimneys and mines were operated by coal, which when burnt, released smoke causing pollution, thereby affecting the health of the workers. And um, the working conditions of coal mines also were so hard. The coal mines especially were extremely risky as well as dangerous places where roofs caved and explosions took place and where lots of injuries were suffered by the workers. To top this, the safety rules also were very few and not that effective. Young children were made to sit at trappers and they would sit in a hole hollowed out for them and held a string to fasten the door. As soon as they heard coal wagons uh, coming, uh, and, um, and they had to open the door by pulling the string. And though this was an easy job, yet the place uh, where they had to sit were clammy and not so hygienic. All the children, on the other hand, were made to work as coal bearers, carrying loads of coal on their backs in huge baskets. And treatment of children, um, it's another issue about bad conditions of working places. So, um, meals uh, were places where thousands of children found employment. Usually orphans were employed here who worked as well as stayed here. The treatment given to these children was quite crude. Most of their time was spent working in the mills, which resulted um, in uh, almost no time for them to get out and take some fresh air. Sundays were mostly spent in cleaning and machines thereby leaving no time for any uh, recreation. In case if the children fell asleep during working, then they were also brutally killed. It's really hard and painful. painful. So working conditions of um, 
children we talked, uh, coal mines, and treatment of children we talked, and working conditions for adults. Uh, this situation was the same for uh, the adult workers as well. Even they slouched for nine hours, were paid insufficiently. It took quite some time for the government to take some actions in order to stop this exploitation. With the passage of time, however, various uh, enactments were passed, like the Mines Act, uh, which prohibited the in employment of women, girls, as well as boys up to a particular age to work in mines. And bastardy, child care, uh, to be born out of wedlock. The term uh, illegitimacy became popular in English society in Victorian era as the population continued to expand. And many parents, especially those of the lower class, were unable to support and account for their children due to poverty and unstable marriages. It was also common for individuals to have children out of wedlock. A child was considered a bastard in a case where the male would leave all support and care of the child to the female. Bastardy became an issue for children. It led to an unstable home life and more impor importantly, limited and equal opportunity to education. As a result, the bastardy clause was enacted to issue relief for uh, illegitimate children. However, it enhanced the illegitimacy of children. So, uh, the Bastardy Clause, uh, also known as the Poor Law Amendment Act of uh, 1839, prohibited uh, parishes from granting unviewed mothers in relief. The law forced women and their children without fathers to enter workhouses that granted them a horrible reputation. So remember uh, workhouses because we'll talk about workhouses in uh, Oliver Twist. And however, there were some people who accepted the law as it would provide food and clothing for the poor as well as schooling for children. As a poor woman could not afford to support their children, most chose to work as servants and lived in their employers' homes without their children. And their weights uh, would pay these other women, um, called baby farmers, to raise their children. And the system functioned well uh, until industrialization and uh, urbanization led to a greater need for different kinds of paid uh, fosterage. So mothers uh, were determined to keep working in the city as uh, weights were higher, but close um, to keep their children in villages and towns with total strangers where conditions were safer. And unfortunately, this form of abandonment led to worsened treatment of children and prolonged child labor. And the other uh, slides, uh, in other slides, you can see the situation, the condition of working places. Um, and here also you see the child is working barefoot. And yeah, it's so painful. And let's talk about Charles Dickens. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, recording or not. So, yes. We are recording. And so uh, they were a lot of re representatives of Victorian uh, literature, but Charles Dickens, so we would say, is one of the most famous uh, Victorian writers. So um, he was an English writer and social critic, and uh, his own life was also so hard you can search about his autobiography um, so uh, his father was uh, present uh, because of his death and he um, he was obliged to work in hard uh, situations and hard conditions in a Polish factory and then uh, in his uh, after his teenager years uh, he started to write um, to work as a, uh, as a at, at the newspaper as a publisher so after that he tried to write his first um, works 
So he was created. He created some of the world's best known fictional characters that are so really uh, famous in world literature, and was regarded by many as the greatest novelist of the Victorian era. And he was a literary genius. So uh, what helped to shape the adult writer? Uh, as I said before, he was also lived in bad uh, condition, so he was poor and he was obliged to work hard. And uh, his father's faults that uh, tried to um, try to make him be experienced in his life, and uh, he was so ill that he couldn't go to school. Uh, but he read a lot, so. Because of reading other works, other literary works of uh, world literature, uh, he started to write something different in his literary activity. And to be, not to be able to go to school due to lack of money also, and starting work at a dirty old factory, in a Polish factory. So such kind of things can just push him to create something different. And so he created his literary activity, so I hope uh, you will remember these words. I didn't write all of his words because it's, uh, it can take a lot of slides to make it, but I just chose some of them. And uh, the Pickwick Papers, The Adventures of Oliver Twist, which we choose to you, and Nicholas Nickleby, The Christmas Carol, David Copperfield, Bleak House, Little Dory, A Tale of Two Cities, and Great Expectations. All of these novels are really famous, and uh, but we will talk about just Oliver Twist. Um, the major themes in Oliver Twist. So, um, Oliver Twist is, among other things, a meditation on the nature of criminality in 1830s. And the first uh, theme is thievery and crime. So, uh, an examination of two, who commits crimes, of the spectrum of crimes, and of the idea of criminality as a learned behavior or an innate quality. So, Oliver is born a poor orphan. He is raised uh, in a workhouse and makes his way to London, where he is rescued by a group of young thieves controlled by Fagan. Thus, Oliver, according to Victorian ideas about the link between poverty and criminality, is seen as being naturally uh, predisposed to crime because he was brought up poor and was not school educated. Oliver is also at risk of learning criminal behavior from Fagan, Charlie Bates, an artful dodger, and Sykes. One of the novel's great questions, therefore, is Will Oliver succumb to this natural predisposition and learn criminal behavior, or will he retain his innate virtue? So, this is the main message and main question of this novel by Dickens. Dickens presents a full range of criminality as a means of describing English criminal society at the time of this writing. Sykes and Fagan are both shown to be natural criminals, meaning they are men for whom crime is an organic outgrowth of their innate badness or evil. But although Dickens is clear in his disapproval of Sykes and Fagan, he nevertheless reserves a certain amount of room uh, for moral complication as regards the criminality of the other characters in the novel. And Dickens uh, acknowledged that Nancy has been forced to commit crimes, but Dickens has a certain amount of sympathy for Nancy's condition, as she was forced to work for Fagan from a young age. And the artful Dodger and Bates are entertaining and funny characters, and there is a despair uh, Dickens ascribes to their condition as Fagan's servants and partners in crime. The Dodger ends up going to a penal colony, and Charlie uh, decides uh, he ought to find honest work and begins um, a series of menial jobs after uh, renouncing his life of crime. And um, Monks is given part of his inheritance by Brownlow in the hopes that he will change, but he too returns to crime. 
Oliver's purity and strength of spirit are never compromised throughout the novel. It's implied that his gentlemanly parentage makes it more likely that he will end up part of a stable family structure and that he will become educated and find legal employment. Thus, Dickens uh, seems to indicate that criminality is, after all, a mixture of moral disposition and of circumstances. Bates uh, transcends his circumstances to live a legal life, but his rewards are few, and his job training poor. Oliver is virtuous and strong, and um, also uh, aided by the help of members of the middle class, and by the fact that he is of noble birth. So the other uh, theme is poverty, institutions, and class. Oliver was a sustained attack on the British poor laws, a complex body of law that forced poor families to labor in prison like workhouses. One of the novel's effects is simply to describe what poverty was like at this time in England. Although uh, many parts of uh, English society had come in contact with the poor, few had read accounts of what it meant to be poor. Simply by telling of conditions in the workhouses, Dickens uh, does a service to the English poor. He shows they are human beings and that they are not treated as such. So Dickens' description of the workhouses and uh, Mr. Bumble, Mrs. Bumble, especially, also serves to show that the poor laws are not simply dehumanizing. They are a part of the cycle of poverty rather than a remedy for it. And the workhouse provides Oliver and others with no meaningful skills, and it feeds them so little that many simply become sick and die. Bumble is a beadle, or an Anglican church uh, official in charge of managing the poor within each country. Dickens show that Bumble behaves unchristianly, so it's a little irony. And... Um, the novel's goal, then, is not just to describe English poverty, it's actively to change perspect uh, per perspective of both poverty and the uh, general sense of Victorian society that poverty is being dealt with humanly and appropriately the hopes of changing society. Dickens' argument about poverty, social institutions and class immobility is a complex imagining of the interrelation of the three. Dickens believes that workhouses play to the worst desires of people in power, people like uh, Sowerberry and the Bumbles, to keep the poor poor. The workhouses then enable to the middle and upper classes to uh, argue for a self-fulfilling prophecy that people who have no options in life, no ability to make a positive contribution to society, either die or become society's outcasts. Dickens does not excuse crime committed by those who are inherently evil, like Fagin and Sykes, but the, he does uh, tend to be more sympathetic to the lives of, uh, lives of um, uh, those uh, that have been determined by terrible circumstances, like Oliver, Nancy, Bates, and Dodger. Dickens champions Oliver above all, since Oliver struggles to mightily to maintain his goodness and manages to do so. So, the other theme is individualism and social bonds. Oliver Twist presents also an inquiry into the nature of individualism in 1930s England and the social bonds that must be formed and sustained uh, by individuals if they are to prosper. One of the novel's most notable scenes in Fagin's speech um, to Noah, arguing that one must look out those for number one, and the number one or Fagin. The thieves Fagin controls all look out for themselves since they would probably not work for Fagin if they were able to earn their living elsewhere. But Fagin argues that since he is in command of this band of thieves, he is truly their number one, or the figure they must obey if they are to continue living. Fagin's organization of the group is based primarily on fear 
If the thieves do not rat one another out, they will be saved from the courts and hanging. So Dickens shows that this is not a strong enough social uh, bond to keep the boys safe. And Bates eventually leaves his life of crime and the Dodger is taken into court. And the boys are encouraged to believe that the Dodger will long be remembered for his deficiency in the courtroom. Sykes hangs himself by mistake and Fagin is tried and sentenced to death on the scaffold. Oliver, however, is an example both of the importance of a strong individual work ethic and of social bonds. Oliver leaves a sober very braves the criminals of Fagin's gang in London and escapes to Brown Brownlow. He is uh, recaptured by Fagin, survives a gunshot to his arm and dodges uh, Sykes, and finally educates himself under Brownlow's tutelage. If he were I'm sorry for pausing, uh, it's almost 35 minutes, so I can't cut it, sorry for that. And I can't really remember exactly when I stopped, but I will try to continue correctly. So we were talking about themes and um, so individualism and social bonds, yes, I remember. So Oliver... Um, Oliver also benefits greatly from the love uh, he receives from Brownlow, Rose, Maylie, and um, also Mr. Lousburn. So Dickens here praises these social bonds above all, the bonds of love and of a family-like atmosphere. The Maylies and Mrs. Maylie uh, move to a personage with Oliver, who is officially adopted by Brownlow, so um, he can continue in his education with uh, all the legal pros uh, prospections and offered it to the child of a gentleman. And social forces, fate and free will, it's also another theme of this novel. In the novel, fate is revealed to be an interaction of uh, social forces or pressures on one's life and one's decisions as an agent processing free will. Oliver is an orphan and a pauper, meaning uh, his fate is more or less sealed from birth. Social forces appear posed to keep him in a low position forever. But Oliver, as it turns out, is the um, illegitimate son of a gentleman and his father has inherited enough money to be able to pass some on to Oliver. Thus Oliver has a, a competing fate, uh, that of a son who realizes his fortune later in life. The grand question of the novel then is which fate will determine the course of Oliver's life? The fate of the pauper or the fate of the gentleman. Other characters have their fates set up and determined in interesting ways. So, most, for example, also the son of a gentleman, seems not to be able to realize his fate as a gentleman himself. He become a criminal and even after inheriting half of his father's money. Um, and although he uh, inheriting half of his father's money, he dissipates it away and returns to crime again. Fagin and his crew, including the Dodger, are mostly fated to remain criminals. Although Fagin does everything he can to avoid detection, it's not a surprise when he is captured at the novel's end and sentenced to death. Similarly, the Dodger, despite this uh, skill in zivery, accepts that it's his fate to be sent to a penal colony. Sykes understands that after he kills Nancy, he is a haunted man and that he can never recover the normal life of his life in crime before the murder. And uh, another uh, theme is city and country. The novel uh, takes place in two separate, morally distinct locations, the country and the city. The country is everything outside London and its uh, outlying villages. London is a primary city. To Dickens, the country is a place of peace, quiet, hard work and strong family structures that ensure people continue to work hard 
and avoid criminality. The city, however, is a place of difficult working conditions, where the poor are crowded together, ground down by all the difficulties of modern industrial life. And Oliver tellingly comes from the country, from a town environment relatively far from London. He makes his way to London to avoid Sorbury, uh, the coffin maker, and uh, uh, live of terrible poverty in the workhouses. But what he finds in the city is not a means of escape, but rather a more difficult life, one of forced criminality. And only when Oliver stumbles, half dead, uh, upon the Maylie's house, far outside the city, does he begin to uh, uh, recuperate, to think uh, lodgingly by Brownlow, and to begin to find a, a stable family life. Oliver ends up near a country personage uh, at the novel's end uh, with the Maylies and those who care about him. He is adopted as Brownlow's legal son, allowing him to be educated in peace and quiet. So Dickens wrote during the English Industrial Revolution's most robust stage, when the cities were becoming the location for all those hoping to make their fortunes and to rise up out of poverty. But cities were also uh, repositories of weeds and uh, poverty and uh, seemed to provide ammunition for those who sought to equate the social diseases of poverty and criminality. Thus Dickens has a complicated relationship to the city and the country as he describes them. He believes that Oliver's virtue is best suited to the country, but that country is rapidly disappearing as England becomes more connected by rail and roads and more economically dependent on the factories of the city. So, um, so he seems to argue that the country provides a kind of serenity and family structure that should be brought back to the city. And the last theme is the role of upbringing. Uh, proper upbringing, um, so it's essential throughout the novel, is illuminated best in the sense where Nancy and Rose first meet. In this scene, uh, Dickens um, shows that the prostitute Nancy to the angelic and utterly perfect Rose. Nancy's potential for godness is clear made so by her very presence uh, there among other things but from use uh, she has been surrounded by liars and thieves and although she transcends their ranks morally she cannot escape from them nor become the person she could have uh, had she had any of the advantages that rose did rose too comes from a rather um, uh, rather um, to good background but from an early age she was raised by the kind and loving mrs maylie who also offered her all the resources she could desire and so she became an example of the perfect female and uh, that's why you, uh, you can uh, write about the role of upbringing according to nancy but of course uh, if you have your own idea about the upbringing uh, the other of the other um, characters, you can add uh, whatever you want. And also, uh, Oliver managed to rise above uh, his upbringing. Surrounded by selfish, ignorant and cruel people for most of his childhood, given no love, care or tenderness, he still managed to maintain his kind disposition and never gives into the low morals of those around him. He is, however, meant to be the exception that proves the rule. The fact that his happy ending is so very miraculous proves how important it is to be loved and cared for in childhood. So, um, and um, the other slide is about the characters. Mm, so I just chose main characters here for you. The first one is the protagonist, Oliver Twist, of course, is a novel's hero. And Oliver Twist is aged nine at the beginning of the novel and several years older by the end. So it's not clear exactly how much time uh, elapses. He is probably about 12. 
Born of an unbut uh, mother, so in a poor house, Oliver is raised in the same poor house, then uh, apprenticed to a coffin maker named Sowerberry. After getting in a fight with another apprentice regarding his mother's reputation, Oliver strikes out for London on foot, where he accidentally falls in with a group of thieves led by Fagan. Oliver is briefly saved by Brownlow, only to be retaken by Nancy, and involved later in a burglary of uh, of the Maylies house that almost kills him. The Maylies, Rose and her aunt, take Oliver in, and the novel traces the discovery of Oliver's parentage, a secret kept uh, close by monks, Oliver's half-brother, who wished to... Um, disinherit his brother and eliminate all traces of Oliver's highborn and ancestry. Oliver ends the novel happily, uh, having been adopted by Brownlow. Throughout the novel, Oliver remains a boy of good morals, despite his um, dire financial situation. And the second main uh, character is Mr. Bl Brownlow, a man who becomes Oliver's adopted father at the end of the novel. And... Um, Brownlow recants his accusation and takes Oliver home to nurture him, uh, but when he sends Oliver out on a mission to return books, uh, Oliver is retaken by Fagan again. And Brownlow is um, distraught at what he believes to be Oliver's betrayal of him, but he never entirely believes that Oliver is a bad at heart and spends the remainder of the novel solving the mystery of Oliver's birth and inheritance. And the other um, main character is Fagan, one of the novel's trio of antagonists. And Fagan is in charge of the boys, his thieves, and their ex exploits pay for his life in London. Fagan attempts to make Oliver a thief, but fails. Fagan is later sentenced to death. Fagan is Jewish and described in extremely anti-Semitic terms by the narrator. And the other character is Nancy, Sykes' romantic partner. Nancy at first takes Oliver back to Fagan, but later expresses regret for this and attempts to protect Oliver as much as she can. After talking one night to Rose and Brownlow and being overheard by Noah, Nancy is killed by Sykes in a range, for Sykes believes Nancy has peached or ratted out the gang, despite the fact that she has staunchly refused to do so. And the other one is Mr. Brownlow, uh, no, sorry, Mr. Bumble, uh, the village uh, beetle of Oliver's home village. Mr. Bumble is another more minor antagonist in the novel. He hates Oliver and eventually marries Mrs. Bumble in order to take over the poor house's control, such uh, that he can order paupers around. But Bumble is exposed as being complicit in a part of Monk's plot and loses his social station. He and his wife later end up paupers in the very same poor house that they used to run. And Mons, Edward Leeford, uh, the second of the novels, uh, the third of the no uh, novels antagonist, uh, Monks. Uh, so Fagin, Mr. Bumble, and Monks, they are antagonists of the novel. Uh, so uh, he was a real. His real name is Edward Leeford, Oliver's half brother, and he is hellbent on keeping his own uh, fraudulent inheritance by eliminating all traces of Oliver's inheritance and on making Oliver into a thief so that his name might be ruined. Monsk uh, fails in this attempt after being caught by Brownlow and admits to his misdeeds and acknowledges Oliver's true parentage. So, uh, the other slides about motifs, we have three main motifs, Oliver's face, hidden family relationships and disguised identities. So, Oliver's face is singled out for special attention at multiple points in the mo novel. Mr. Sowerberry, uh, Char uh, Charlie Bates and uh, Toby Tra Crackett all comment on its particular appeal and its resemblance to the portrait of Agnes Fleming provide the first clue to Oliver's identity. The power of Oliver's um, um, uh, appearance, uh, combined with the fact that Fagin is hideous and uh, Rose is beautiful, suggests that in the world of the novel, external appearance usually gives a fair impression of a person's inner character. 
and hidden uh, family relationships, the re revelation of Oliver, uh, Oliver's familial ties um, is among the novel's most unlikely plot turns. Oliver is related to Brownlow, who was married to his father's sister, to Rose, who is his aunt, and to Monks, who is his half-brother. The coincidence involved in these facts are quite unbelievable and represent the novel's rejection of realism in favor of fantasy. Oliver is at first believed to be an orphan without parents or relatives, a position that would in that time and place almost certainly seal his doom. Yet, by the end of the novel, it's revealed that he has more relatives than just about anyone else in the novel. This uh, reversal of his fortune strongly um, resembles the fulfillment of a naive child's wish. It also suggests the mystical binding power of family relationships. Brownlow and Rose take to Oliver immediately, uh, even though he is implicated in an attempted robbery of Rose's house. While Monks recognizes Oliver, the instant he sees him on the street, the influence of blood ties. It seems can be felt even before anyone knows those ties exist. And the other motive, the last motive, is disguised identities. The plot of Oliver Twist revolves uh, around the various false identities that other characters impose upon Oliver. After, um, so for the sake of advancing their own interests, and Mr. Uh, Bumble and the other workhouse officials insist on portraying Oliver as something he's not an ungrateful, immoral pauper. Monsk does his best to conceal Oliver's real identity so that Mons himself can claim Oliver's rightful inheritance. Characters also disguise their own identities when it serves them well to do so. Nancy pretends to be Oliver's middle-class sister in order to get him back to Fagan, while Monks changes his name and poses as a common criminal rather than he uh, their uh, he really is. And scenes depicting the manipulation of clothing uh, indicate how it plays an important part in the construction of various char characters' identities. Nancy don't um, need clothing to pass an a middle class uh, girl, and uh, Fagan strips Oliver to all his upper class uh, credibility when he takes from him the suit of clothes purchased by Brownlow. The novel's resolution revolves around the revelation of the real identities of Oliver, Rose and Monks. Only when every character's identity is known with a certainty does the story achieve real closure. And uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about symbols. The main symbol is coffins then London Bridge and characters' names. Coffins uh, crop up repeatedly uh, in the novel and symbolize not only the proximity of death throughout Oliver Twist, but the very real possibility that Oliver himself will not live long enough to realize his high birth and receive his due inheritance. So Oliver um, is a apprenticed first to Sowerberry, a coffin maker, and is forced to sleep among the coffins uh, while in the house. Uh, Oliver is made to witness numerous burials while working as a mute mourner for Sowerberry. Someone brought along to enlarge the size of a funeral party. Other characters in the novel, too, uh, use coffins in their figures of speech. And um, so Oliver manages at the end of the novel to avoid the uh, grisly fate, the waiting coffin reserved for others, Nancy and his mother among them. And London Bridge is another symbol, that is a, one of the main symbols in this novel. Nancy's decision to meet Brownlow and Rose on London Bridge reveals the symbolic aspect uh, of this bridge in Oliver Twist. Bridges exist to link two places that would otherwise uh, be separated by an uncrossable chasm. And the meeting on London Bridge represents the collision of two worlds unlikely ever to come into contact. 
the idyllic world of Brownlow and Rose, and the atmosphere of degradation in which Nancy lives. On the bridge, Nancy is given the chance to cross over to the better way of life that the others represent, but she rejects that opportunity, and by the time uh, the three have all left the bridge, that possibility has vanished forever. And characters' names uh, represent personal qualities. Oliver Twist himself is the most obvious example. The name Twist, uh, though given by accident, alludes to the outrageous reversals of fortune that he will experience. Rose Maley's name echoes her association with flowers and uh, springtime, youth and beauty. Toby Crackett, uh, this name is a light rated reference to this cousin profession of breaking into houses. Mr. Bumble's name um, connotes uh, this bumbling uh, arrogance, and Mrs. Mance, her lack of maternal instinct, and Mr. Grimwick, uh, his superficial grimness that can be removed as easily as a wig. So, um, and let's analyze some quotes, uh, some quotations from the novel. So, um, you can pause the video and read this um, quote, because if I read the quote, it will uh, take our time. So, pause the video and read it, then I will explain the meaning. So, uh, the opening sentence of Oliver Twist displays Dickens' slightly satirical style at full plate, and the extensive verbiage, the florid distinct, the sheer length of the sentence, all conspire to lend a sense of authority to the proceedings. Ironically, uh, it's, it's that very sense of authority that Dickens will proceed to lambast, and in more openly emotional and earnest terms condemn throughout the book. Here, Dickens opens with a touch of humor, a sense of the storyteller as wit, while hinting via the reference to the workhouse, the darker vision that lies ahead. And the second uh, quote, again, you can pause the video, read it, and then I will explain. So, this passage exempl exemplifies Dickens' perspective of London in Oliver Twist. It's bleak, seedy, poor, and filled with immoral people. And uh, these scenes of urban description throughout the novel are often set at night or in the rain. The weather is really kind to the slums of London. Here the problem of children without caring parents is exemplified too, uh, for there are children everywhere, yet no sign of any adults taking care of them. And instead, all of the adults seem to be busy drinking in the pubs. In the city, the poor gather in the pubs, and um, while in the country they gather in the church, and this seems to symbolize a great difference between the two communities, why in one setting people can be picturesque and in other they are repulsive. And the third one, pause the video please. This passage uh, provides a central example of the danger of mob mentality, um, a concept so important to the book as a whole. When the cry is first taken up against Oliver, it's carried by individuals. And uh, the mob dominates completely, and uh, with the loss of any individualism comes the loss of any individual uh, culpability. No one considers its he is her responsibility to be sure that Oliver is really a thief. No one asks for evidence or details of the situation. Dickens' uh, um, repetition of the cry at the beginning and end of the paragraph emphasizes the feeling of the inevitability of the cry once enough voices have joined in. And quote number four, uh, again pause the video please. 
This passage uh, exemplifies the idealism with uh, which the novel sees the countryside, whereas descriptions of the city, and especially the slums, are always negative and bleak. Here even the poor are desirable and healthy. This passage also gives the country uh, a genius uh, that is lacking in the city. Discussion of religion there is usually about the hypocrisy of those who consider themselves Christian, while in uh, this passage the singing is the best Oliver has heard, not because um, it's done well, but it but, but because it comes from true Christians, not hypocritical ones. And the main idea of Oliver Twist, uh, of course, after reading the novel, you can find out main messages of this novel. But the first uh, message, I would say that it's through Oliver's character, Dickens wanted to show that people could not be spoiled if they were born good and honest. So we can see this message from the character of Oliver. And there would be no misery, no crimes, and no poverty if all brown laws adopted all Olivers. It means if all rich people would help to poor ones, there wouldn't be any misery, any crimes, and any poverty. It's really correct. And Dickens helped change the world by means of charity. And uh, I would like to know about your own opinions. Uh, how do you think? What's the main message of this novel? Of course, I will ask it in our seminar. And uh, please, if you didn't take any note, uh, try to watch this video lesson again and try to make notes for yourself. Because as you see, every uh, lesson I just write here keywords and then I explain the meaning of them. And then when I give you the quizzes and when I give you uh, questions, I use the uh, meanings that I uh, opened in the slide. So I don't just uh, ask you, tell me about the themes. I ask you, explain this theme. So uh, to be able to explain this theme, you have to make the notes when I talk. And that's the end. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and please read the original novel I, uh, I've sent it to you and watch um, this video carefully, listen carefully and um, thanks a lot for watching. See you next time. Bye.